Hoboing is a common pastime in 1931. For some, riding freights is an appealing adventure compared to the drudgery and dreariness of their daily lives. Others hop rail cars to move from one usually fruitless job search to the next. America is in the grips of the Great Depression. Two dozen or so young people, whites and African Americans both, ride the Southern Railway's Chattanooga to Memphis freight. The riders include four black Chattanooga teenagers seeking government jobs in Memphis, hauling logs on the river. Five other African Americans on the train come from various parts of Georgia. The whites on the train include two young men and two young women dressed in overhauls who are returning to Huntsville from unsuccessful job searches in the cotton mills of Chattanooga. Soon after the train crosses the Alabama border, a white youth walks across the top of the tank car. He steps on the hand of a black youth named Haywood Patterson, who is hanging on to its side. Patterson has friends aboard the train. A stone-throwing fight erupts between the white youth and the larger group of black youth. Eventually, the African Americans succeed in forcing all but one of the white youths off the train. As the train accelerates to a life-endangering speed, Patterson takes pity on Orville Gilly and pulls him safely back onto the train. One white boy foist off the train contacts a local station manager. He describes the assault by the gang of black youths. The station, station master wires ahead. A posse in Paint Rock, Alabama stops the train. Dozens of men with guns rush at the train as it grinds to a halt. The armed men round up every black youth they can find, a total of nine. The youths are tied together with a plow line, loaded on a flatbed truck, and taken to a jail in Scottsboro. What could have been a minor incident, quickly forgotten, but for the words of one white woman on the train, tells the member of a posse. Ruby Bates says that she, as well as her companion, Victoria Price, had been gang raped by the black teenagers. The nine black youths arrested at Paint Rock became known as the Scottsboro Boys. The truth is, none of them were from Scottsboro, and not all of them were boys. Some were as young as 12 and 13, but they ranged in age to 19. And though many of them had never met each other prior to that train ride, they are forever linked by the name Scottsboro Boys and the fate that they shared. The legal nightmare of the Scottsboro Boys extended for decades. The ordeal made celebrities out of anonymities, launched and ended careers, wasted lives, produced heroes, opened Southern juries to African Americans, exacerbated sectional strife, and divided, then united, America's political left. In one sense, the Scottsboro Boys' trial is a story about nine people in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it is also the story about what was wrong and maybe a little bit about what was right with our justice system in the 1930s. Why Ruby Bates told what everyone today understands to be a bald-faced lie will never be known for certain. We can only speculate. Perhaps she hoped to divert attention from her own behavior. Traveling from Tennessee, as she was doing with a boyfriend, was a possible violation of the Mann Act that criminalizes the crossing of state lines for immoral purposes. Or perhaps she wanted to get even with some of the African Americans who forced her boyfriend from the train. But whatever the reason, Ruby's accusation put the black youth in a life-threatening situation. In jail, guards placed the Scottsboro Boys in a lineup. Victoria Price pointed out six of the nine who she said raped her. One of the accused called Price a liar and was struck by a bayonet. A guard said, if those six had Miss Price, it stands to reason that the others had Miss Bates. A crowd of several hundred men surrounded the Scottsboro jail that night. Their plans to lynch the nine youths were foiled by Alabama's governor, B.M. Miller, who sent dozens of National Guardsmen to protect the suspects. Twelve days later, the first set of trials opened. One of the defendants, Haywood Patterson, described the scene in the courtroom as, quote, one big smiling white face. 
Few in the crowd doubted the defendant's guilt. The local Scottsboro newspaper published a story before the trial with the headline, quote, all Negroes positively identified by girls and one white boy who was held prisoner with pistol and knives while nine black fiends committed revolting crime. Apart from the prejudgment, the defendants had another big problem. The defense lawyers were no dream team. One was an unpaid and unprepared real estate attorney from Tennessee. On the first day of trial, the lawyer showed up so stewed he could hardly walk straight. The other defense attorney was forgetful and doddering. He hadn't tried a case in decades. The Scottsboro boys were tried rapid fire over a three-day period in groups of two or three. The trials were a total disaster for the defense. There was no probing cross-examination of Victoria Price or Ruby Bates, even though their testimony contradicted each other. Defense attorneys didn't bother to cross-examine the two doctors who examined the alleged victims. The only witnesses called by the defense were the defendants themselves, and they ended up accusing each other. Defendant Clarence Norris provided what one paper called the highlight of the trial when he accused his fellow defendants. They all raped her, every one of them. No closing argument was offered by the defense attorneys. A local editorialist described the state's case as so conclusive as to be almost perfect. To make matters worse, verdicts in one trial were announced to the crowd outside the courthouse when the next trial was underway inside. Defendants and jurors alike could hear the crowd's roar of approval when the guilty verdicts were announced. When the four trials were over, Eight of the nine Scottsboro boys were sentenced to death. For 12-year-old Roy Wright, 11 of the 12 jurors voted for death, but one juror held out for life imprisonment on account of his tender age. The Scottsboro trials got big play in the national press. Many people expressed shock at the swiftness and the severity of the sentences. Still, the NAACP, the organization you might expect would rush to the Scottsboro Boys' defense, hesitated. Rape is a loaded charge. If the defendants really were guilty, the thinking went, it would be bad PR for the NAACP, which at the time was a young organization trying to build support for civil rights among moderate whites. Few in the organization had any interest in defending gang rapists. So, into the void steps the Communist Party. The Communists saw the case as a great recruiting tool among Southern Blacks and Northern Liberals. Through its legal arm, the International Labor Defense, or ILD, the Communists called the case against the young Blacks a murderous frame-up. The Scottsboro Boys were like drowning people, and the on only the Communists threw them a rope, so they grabbed it. In a decision that shaped the course of every subsequent event, practically, each and every defendant agreed to be represented in their appeals and subsequent trials by the Communist Party. And communists in the South were treated with all the courtesy afforded a gang of rapists. The Alabama Supreme Court affirmed the convictions and the death sentences. But the United States Supreme Court in a landmark decision, saw things differently. In Paul versus Alabama, the Supreme Court, on a 7-2 to two vote, ruled for the first time that the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause guaranteed defendants the right to competent counsel in capital cases. Whatever the Scottsboro boys got, the court said, it wasn't competent. There should be new trials. As they awaited their retrials, the Scottsboro boys spent the better part of two years in Alabama's notorious Kilby prison. Once or twice a week, they were allowed to leave their tiny cells and walk, handcuffed, a few yards down the hall to the shower. On execution days, they watched inmates carried off to the death chamber and then heard the awful sounds of electrocution. In an early report on the case worthy of reading in its entirety, Hollis Ransdell described the defendants as terrified and bewildered 
like scared little mice caught in a trap. What a difference a trial makes. The second trial featured a star-studded courtroom cast, not a bunch of bumbling amateurs. The Scottsboro boys were represented by Samuel Leibowitz, who was assisted by ILD's chief attorney. Recruited by the Communist Party, Leibowitz was a flamboyant New York City criminal lawyer with an astonishing record of success. In 78 murder trials, he won 77 acquittals. Leibowitz worked on the Scottsboro case for four years without pay. This was a fight he believed in. Alabama's Attorney General, Thomas Knight Jr., headed the prosecution team. Judge James Horton served as the presiding judge, doing what a good judge should do, impartially calling balls and strikes. The second trial of Haywood Patterson opened in March 1933 in Decatur, Alabama. Leibowitz first sought to quash the indictments on the ground that the African Americans had been systematically excluded from the jury rolls. He raised eyebrows by questioning the veracity of local jury commissioners. Local people expressed shock when he insisted that Prosecutor Knight stop his practice of referring to black witnesses by their first names. For many Alabamians, it was one thing to defend rapists. That, after all, is part of our American justice system. But it was another unforgivable thing to attack their social order and their way of life. The motion to quash the indictment was denied and the prosecution opened its case. The star witness, of course, was Victoria Price. Direct examination was brief, lasting only 16 minutes. Price recounted her job hunting trip to Chattanooga, the fight on the train between whites and black youths, and the gang rape in which Haywood Patterson allegedly was one of the attackers. Prosecutor Knight's strategy was to cover the essentials in a condensed, unadorned way. He wanted to minimize the opportunities for defense attorneys to expose contradictions that might in some way be more easily exposed with a detailed and implausible story that she told in the first trial. Leibowitz's cross-examination of Price was merciless. His questions suggested his answers. She never, as she claimed, stayed at Callie Brochie's boarding house in Chattanooga. There was no boarding house. There was no Callie Brochie. The semen found in Price came not from a rape on the freight train, but from an adulterous encounter with a man named Jack Tiller in the Huntsville freight yards two days earlier. Leibowitz's question suggested Price to be sexually promiscuous, most likely a prostitute. His questions hinted that Price and Bates made groundless accusations of rape to deflect attention from their own Mann Act violations. During the entire four-hour cross-examination, Price remained sarcastic, evasive, and venomous. She used her ignorance and claimed poor memory to her advantage. She was a difficult witness to corner. Dr. R. R. Bridges, the Scottsboro doctor who examined the girls less than two hours after the alleged rape, was the next prosecution witness to take the stand. He turned out to be a better witness for the defense. He confirmed that semen was found in the vaginas of the two women, but noted that the semen was non-motile. That is, it contained no live sperm even though sperm generally live from 12 to 48 hours after intercourse. Moreover, Dr. Bridges admitted on cross-examination that the women were both calm, composed, and free of bleeding and vaginal damage. Not exactly the sort of condition one would expect two hours after a brutal gang rape. The prosecution's only eyewitness was a farmer with land along the rail line named Ori Dobbins. Dobbins testified that the defendants grabbed Price and Bates as they were about to leap from the train. The credibility of the farmer's testimony was seriously damaged by Leibowitz on cross. Leibowitz asked Dobbins, how could he be sure, given the speed of the train and his distance from it, that he saw a woman and not a man? Dobbins answered, 
she was wearing women's clothes. Whoops. It had been admitted both Bates and Price wore overalls on the day in question. Are you sure it wasn't overalls or a coat? Judge Horton asked. No, sir. A dress, Dobbins replied. When the defense had its turn to call witnesses, six of the Scottsboro boys testified. Willie Robertson told the jury that on the day of the alleged rape, he was suffering from a serious case of venereal disease and was so weak he could not walk without a cane, let alone leap from a boxcar to a boxcar, as Price had claimed. Attorney General Knight ran into difficulty in his cross-examination of Haywood Patterson. Unable to shake his account of the train ride, Knight asked, were you tried in Scottsboro? Patterson replied, I was framed in Scottsboro. Knight shot back, who told you to say that? Patterson answered, I told myself to say it. Lester Carter, the traveling companion of Bates and Price, was one of the defense's most spectacular witnesses. Carter was one of the whites who jumped off the train when the fighting broke out. In her testimony, Price denied having met Carter before the day of the alleged rape. But Carter testified he had indeed met Bates, Price, and Price's boyfriend, Jack Tiller, in the Huntsville Hobo Jungle on the night before the travel that took them to Chattanooga. He told the jury that the night the four of them were together in the Hobo Jungle, he made love to Ruby Bates, while Price did the same with Tiller. The appearance of the defense's final witness, Ruby Bates, might have been taken from the script of a hokey Hollywood movie. In the months before the trial, Bates's whereabouts was a mystery. Leibowitz announced that he was resting his cage. Then he approached the bench and asked for a short recess. Minutes later, a National Guardsman opened the back door of the courtroom and, to the gasp of spectators and the dismay of night, in walked Ruby Bates. Bates testified that she suffered from a troubled conscience after the testimony that she gave in the first trial. On the advice of famous New York minister Harry Emerson Fosick, she decided to return to Alabama from New York City and tell the truth about what happened. Bates told the jury there was no rape. None of the defendants touched her or even spoke to her. She made her accusation of rape after Price told her to frame up a story to avoid moral charges. On cross-examination, Knight ripped into Bates. He confronted her with her conflicting testimony in the first trials and implied that her new versions of events had been bought with new clothes and other Communist Party gifts. In the summations that followed, none was more controversial than that of Wade Wright, who assisted Attorney General Knight in the prosecution. In a line that would move thousands of Jews around the country to protest, Wright asked the Patterson jurors whether justice in this case is going to be bought and sold with Jew money from New York. At that, Leibowitz jumped up and demanded a mistrial. The motion, however, was denied. Knight seemed embarrassed by his colleague's blatantly anti-Semitic appeal. In his own summation, he told jurors, I do not want a verdict based on racial prejudice or religious creed. But Knight was no model of decorum. He referred to Haywood Patterson as, quote, that thing. Leibowitz, in his summation, called the accusation of Price foul, contemptible, outrageous lie of an abandoned woman. He closed with the Lord's Prayer in an all or nothing appeal to the jury, acquit them or give them the chair. Judge Horton reminded the jury that it was their job to do justice, not pass judgment on the tactics of lawyers. You are not trying lawyers, you are not trying state lines. On April 8th, 1933, the jury was sent out to deliberate the fate of Haywood Patterson. The next day, the jury emerged from the jury room laughing. 
That led some in the defense camp to think that they must have won an acquittal. They were wrong. The jury pronounced Patterson guilty and sentenced him to death. The decision on guilt had taken only five minutes. Leibowitz was stunned. Safely back in New York, after the trial, Leibowitz said of the jury that had just found his client guilty, If you ever saw those creatures, those bigots whose mouths are slits in their faces, whose eyes popped out at you like frogs, whose chins dripped tobacco juice, be whiskered and filthy, you would not ask how they could do it. Ruby Bates returned east with Leibowitz. She became the leading lady at Communist Party sponsored events and rallies. At the protest, she begged forgiveness for her false accusation, pleaded for justice for the boys, and joined in the singing of the inter Internationale. On June 22, 1933, Judge James Horton convened court to hear a defense motion for a new trial. Hardly anyone held out hope that the motion would be granted. But Horton had become convinced that Price was lying. Not only was her story full of inconsistencies, but it was not corroborated by other witnesses or by medical evidence. Judge Horton had one additional reason to believe that Patterson was innocent, and that would remain a secret until years after the trial. After Dr. Bridges presented his medical testimony, the prosecution had requested that Dr. M. H. Lynch, originally listed as a prosecution witness, be excused from testifying. His testimony would only be redundant, according to Knight. After Horton excused the young doctor, the judge was approached by Lynch, who said he wanted to talk privately. Horton and Lynch talked in the courthouse men's bathroom while armed guards stood outside the door. Lynch told Horton he was convinced that the girls were lying, had told them so to their faces, and that they merely laughed at him. Horton urged Lynch to testify, but Lynch, only a few, few years out of medical school and just building a practice in Scottsboro, resisted, saying to do so would ruin his career. Sympathizing with Lynch's predicament, Horton withdrew his demand. A well-connected politician from Montgomery visited Judge Horton to warn him that setting aside the jury's verdict in this case would be political suicide. Horton made it clear to his visitor that his re-election prospects had nothing to do with the matter. He cited a motto his mother often repeated, let justice be done though the heavens may fall. When lawyers reassembled for what everyone expected to be a routine denial of the defense motion for a new trial, Horton announced his stunning decision. He set aside the jury verdict and the death sentence and ordered a new trial. The emissary from Montgomery proved right about his prediction. Horton, who was previously unopposed the last time he ran, lost his judgeship in the next election. Attorney General Knight announced that the state would press ahead with prosecutions, and the prosecutor had reasons for optimism. The new trial for Haywood Patterson would not be in Judge Horton's courtroom, but before Judge William Callahan. Judge Callahan acted more like a second prosecutor than a judge. He sustained virtually every prosecution objection and overruled virtually every defense objection. He cut off all defense inquiry into Price's chastity, character or reputation. And when Leibowitz persisted with questioning designed to suggest Price might have had sex with someone other than a Scottsboro boy around the time of the alleged, alleged rape, Callahan reprimanded him. In his instructions, Callahan told the jury that they should presume that no white woman in Alabama would ever consent to sex with a black. At the close of the instructions, in the Patterson trial, Callahan even failed to provide the jury with the form for an acquittal until the prosecution, fearing reversible error, urged him to do so. Patterson said of Callahan, he couldn't get me to the chair fast enough. Guilty verdicts were quickly returned by juries in 
both in the Patterson trial and in the Clarence Norris trial that followed. Callahan sentenced each prisoner to death and Leibowitz promised to appeal the verdicts to hell and back. In 1935, the United States Supreme Court heard arguments in the Patterson and Norris cases. Leibowitz argued that the conviction should be overturned because Alabama excluded black persons from the jury rolls in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. That the names of black persons appeared on jury rolls introduced in Judge Cor Callahan's courtroom were, Leibowitz told the jurors, justices, forged sometime after the start of the Patterson trial. Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes asked Leibowitz if he could prove that allegation. Leibowitz called a page to bring in the actual jury rolls and a magnifying glass. The Chief Justice looked at the rolls then passed it to the next seated justice, who then passed it on to the next justice. Looks of disgust appeared on their faces. Six weeks later, the Supreme Court announced their decision in Norris versus Alabama. The court unanimously held that the Alabama system of jury selection was unconstitutional. It reversed once again the convictions of Norris and Patterson. Leibowitz said, I am thrilled beyond words. He hoped that the court's decision would convince Alabama that the Scottsboro cases were no longer worth their economic and political costs. But Alabama stubbornly refused to give in. The state tried Haywood Patterson a fourth time. To the surprise of no one, a jury again convicted Patterson of rape. What was surprising, however, was that this jury sentenced Patterson to 75 years in prison rather than giving him the death sentence. One determined Methodist on the jury succeeded in persuading the other 11 to go along with his compromise. The verdict represented the first time in the history of Alabama that a black man convicted of raping a white woman had not been sentenced to death. Finally, there was the first serious talk of compromise and what had become in the eyes of many the case of the white people of Alabama versus the rest of the world. In December of 1936, while Patterson's appeal was still pending and the other eight prisoners awaited their next trials, Thomas Knight met secretly with Samuel Leibowitz in New York. Knight told Leibowitz that the cases were draining Alabama financially and politically, and that he himself was sick of it all. He offered to drop prosecutions for three of the defendants, if the others accepted sentences of no more than 10 years for either rape or assault. Leibowitz was reluctant to accept any deal that included jail time for any of his innocent clients. But Knight had a strong bargaining position. Guilty or not, any trial would almost certainly result in a conviction. So Leibowitz agreed to the compromise with a heavy heart. Before the compromise could be implemented, Attorney General Knight died suddenly, and one week later, Judge Callahan announced that he would begin the next set of trials. Seven of the nine Scottsboro boys had been held in jail now for over six years without trial by the time Clarence Norris was convicted for his third trial in July of 1937. Convictions of three more Scottsboro boys followed in quick succession, and each was sentenced to a long term in prison. But then came the big news. Prosecutors announced that all charges were being dropped against the remaining four defendants. Leibowitz led the four freed Scottsboro boys from the jail to an awaiting car, which quickly whisked them to the Tennessee border. Free of Alabama, but not of the label Scottsboro boy or from the wounds inflicted by six years in prison, they went on to their separate lives, to marriage, to alcoholism, to jobs, to fatherhood, to hope, to disillusionment, to disease, to suicide. The five Scottsboro boys left in Alabama dealt with the knowledge that their continued confinement bought the freedom of the others. They struggled with life in the hell holes of prisons, Atmar Prison near Mobile, was a desperate place, teeming with poisonous snakes, sadistic guards, 
rapacious prisoners. Kilby Prison near Birmingham housed Alabama's electric chair. One of Haywood Patterson's jobs was to carry out the bodies of electrocuted inmates. The five survived, but barely. Eventually, by 1950, either through paroles or escapes, all of the Scottsboro boys found their way out of Alabama. In 1976, the last surviving Scottsboro boy, Clarence Norris, received a full pardon from the state of Alabama, signed by Governor George Wallace. The Scottsboro Boys' trial stand as one of the most shameful examples of injustice in our nation's history. The trials show that in the deep south of the 1930s, black lives didn't count for much. Whether or not they thought the defendants proven guilty, the jurors wanted to send a message to Leibowitz and the rest of America. Don't attack our way of life. Don't mess with our justice system. But even if it's tempting to condemn a whole region of the country for its bigotry, it's simplistic and it's unfair. There were good people of the South, courageous newspaper editors, attorneys, ministers, and others who fought for justice for the Scottsboro Boys. One Southerner's actions stood out above all the others. The decision of Judge James Horton to set aside the conviction of Haywood Patterson, despite the consequences that decision would have for his own career, was heroism, pure and simple. The trials mattered for another reason. Outrage over the verdict spread from radical circles to ordinary people. The trial sparked a new movement a movement made up of whites and blacks marching together for civil rights, a sight not seen in this country really since abolitionist days. Communists, meanwhile, used the case to build up their membership. Membership in the United States peaked in 1942. Ruby Bates counted herself a member. The Supreme Court decision overturning the third set of convictions, Norris versus Alabama, Four southern states to begin seating black jurors. With the presence of interracial juries, the stage was set for later victories in civil rights cases. So out of the tragedy that was Scottsboro came the seeds of change. The South would never be the same.